Now, that first question, uh, why do women and girls leave and where do they go? I think it's important before we dig into that, why girls leave the sport, we just need to remind ourselves that sport isn't the only factor affecting our environment. We have psychosocial, um, uh, I guess, academic and vocational, develop and vocational development intertwines in our lives. And each stage, I guess you could say, promotes key influences, whether they're parents, coaches and peers. So that part, what I've just spoken about with key influences, keep that in the back of your mind as this discussion keeps progressing, because those key influences can um, either support your transition into sport and staying into sport, or those key influences can help assist you or not really help assist you, but push you towards transitioning out of sport into other areas. Um, you'll see I try to acknowledge the, um, I guess, the references as well, and I'm happy to provide those. I haven't put those on, on every slide, um, but I can provide those to Jared afterwards. Uh, next slide, please, Jared. It's important to understand as well what our current environment looks like, um, and I won't dwell too much on this slide other than to draw your attention to the highlighted areas. And these are the percentage of, um, I guess, women, female representation at different levels in our sport. So as a participant, you'll see that the number of registered female participants at the grassroots, le grassroots level is 31.6%. In coaches, it depends on what tier you are coaching at, um, but you will recognise that in terms of Australian junior um, championships, only 16.4% of women are actually head coaches at national championships. If we move on to administration and state associations, um, you'll see again that that percentage of women at board directors sits at a healthy 44%, but that's probably a reflection of, um, I guess, uh, government quotas um, for funding. So I'm not really sure whether the percentage of women on boards is really because um, it's, uh, um, it, whether it's representative of the fact that more women have applied to be on boards or whether it's uh, because an association would like to um, secure its funding through their state or territory government. The other thing to note is that we have had a range of women in sport programs over the last 10 years and yet it's really disappointing to see that at an Olympic Games the number of uh, the percentage of Australian accredited coaches who are women at London was 12% and then it fell in Rio to 9%. Uh, so again, it's trying to, I guess, show the context, the environment before we move on to why women and girls actually leave. Uh, next slide, please, Jared. These stats are taken directly out of um, the Ausplay data from Sport Australia or the old Australian Sports Commission. Um, it shows the top 10 sports and physical activities for adults over 15 and the top 10 sport and physical activity for um, kids between zero and 14 years of age. And you'll see that basketball sits, I, saw, I guess, in a sort of healthy place. Um, but what is really of concern is that it sits below netball um, and netball's, I think, about three or four. Uh, I can't really see now because I'm trying to look at my phone. Um, yeah, so we're probably sitting at about, what, seventh out of the top, spent, top 10 sports and physical activity. Next slide, please, Jared. And this is where the rubber hits the road. So why do women and girls leave? Um, the research would suggest that 50% of females obviously leave sport around the 15 to 17 years, that there are a range of factors um, and you can read them on the slide. I don't really have to read them to you, but this goes back to that, um, I guess, that sphere of influence or those key influences that um, females have in their lives. So at different ages, uh, you might have a parent like myself who was a coach or who was a player um, and encouraged their children to play sport. Um, and they, they more than likely are, are probably 
seeing, I guess, the home environment as one of a positive role modelling environment where sport is um, not so much important, but it's part of the lifestyle and part of the culture of the family. So you're more than likely to stay playing. Um, if you don't have that, I guess, that family support or if your family doesn't have the resources, so we're talking about transport to and from games. Um, if your parents aren't able to, uh, I guess, pay, pay fees or prioritise sport in terms of paying fees so that you can play, um, then it becomes very difficult for uh, a young female to make a decision. Do they continue playing where they have to keep asking their parents to stump up for fees? Um, or do they perhaps go and look at and to explore other areas of their lives, which might be they take uh, more time to, to devote to their academic pursuits or they've decided to take on more part-time work. Um, I think uh, I haven't seen a lot of research that talks about um, uh, girls leaving sport because of uh, boyfriends or partners and Martha might be able to speak to that um, a bit more than, than what I can. Um, but it's normally something that's bandied around and, and I think just because you say something often enough doesn't mean that it is true. Uh, so I always hear that girls leave sport because they get boyfriends. I, I never hear that boys leave sport because they have girlfriends. Um, so I think what narrative you choose to use, what um, example you choose to give, um, make sure that it's one that I guess um, feels comfortable to you. The, the girls leaving sport because of boyfriends has never felt comfortable for me. And I don't know whether that's a lived experience for me um, uh, or not, or it's just that I enjoyed sport and stayed in it. And if I did have a boyfriend, well, then they should actually enjoy playing sport or watching me play sport as well. Um, one thing the research does tell us um, is around body image. Um, and this is, I guess this is the part where uh, uniforms come into play. And I, I can remember when bodysuits were in, um, the issues that teams had with bodysuits. Um, I guess the issues where you have to tuck your shirt in, where the referee tells you that you can't get onto the court if you're, you haven't tucked your shirt in. And I've gone, gosh, I've had two kids. The last thing I want to do is tuck my shirt in. Can I leave it out, please? Um, you know, to even being able to wear a T-shirt underneath my playing top and if it's not the right colour, I, I can't play. Um, so those sorts of things, are, I guess, are critical in making any female, any girl feel comfortable and safe in that environment of sport. They have to not just feel comfortable in themselves, but they have to feel comfortable in what they're wearing. Um, so it's, I guess, one of the lessons um, I guess I've learnt over time is that um, things don't have to look pretty on the court. You know, as long as a referee can tell the number, um, can tell the difference between the teams, do we really care if the shorts are mismatched? Um, the... The, the last point around the lack of positive role models, there is so much out there in terms of social media. Um, I guess the, the tagline, uh, you can't be what you can't see. Um, and I think that is incredibly valid in basketball. Um, I just refer back to that point around the 16% of coaches at national junior championships. Um, if you are an aspiring coach and all you see at a national championship are males, then you begin to question as to whether or not you actually have what it takes to coach at that level. Um, and that becomes a bit of a barrier. So when you are looking at these dot points, um, these six or seven dot points, I want you to ask yourself what you actually think of this research. Um, obviously I haven't, I've just pulled out the, the main themes. Um, and again, I'm happy to send you through the links. What do you think is actually missing from this in your environment? Because remember, I, I keep saying environment is critical. Your context is critical and it may be a little bit different. And if you do relate to those dot points, what does your club do to address these issues? What does it do to address the lack of confidence or, or not having fun, you know, or the time commitment? What does your club actively engage in to address those issues? 
So a very long winded answer to a very short question, Jared. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Martha, did you have anything to, to add to that about why do girls and women leave uh, basketball and sport and where are they going? Well, it kind of leads nicely what Chris has said into, into the next question anyway. So if you like, um, do you want me to, to go into that, Jared? Because I do cover some of what Chris said and can add to that. Please, most definitely. Okay, so um, the next question was around really what a girl's searching for in, in their sport. Um, Jared, if you can just flick to um, my slides, that would be great. And if you wanted to go to the next slide, yeah, I think this is really great image if you could keep in mind during this presentation and that we have the, the girls and women in sport at the centre there. Um, but it really is, uh, everyone needs to be on board, whether it's the club, uh, the parent and the coach, we all need to be on board here. It's no one area to be solved. It's not up to just the club to sort it out. Um, and it's not the parent, it's not the coach. So the more we can work, work together here, the better traction we will have. And when I talk, I guess I'm talking from a broader perspective. It's so fantastic to have Chris's basketball perspective on this uh, because where I'm coming from is, is more broader. So um, hopefully that perspective is quite helpful as well. Um, so if we can just keep that triangle support in, in mind with everything that we're doing, uh, particularly as a coach, engaging with the parents and being on board with what the club's doing in this area will really uh, help dramatically. If you just want to go on to the next slide, Jared, I thought it would be good um, to set a little bit of the scene before I, I go into those solutions at the end. I also have put references on here, but some of the slides are missing references, but I will have those final ones as well. Um, and I think it's, these, it's really important to also keep in mind that the research is showing us that from 14 years of age, girls start to drop out of sport twice as fast as boys. So there is a problem that needs to be addressed and it can be addressed. But um, as a starting point, let's just think about some of those benefits of sport that are there for girls and remind us of, of how important that is from so many different perspectives that maybe we haven't always thought of whether it is those mental, physical and social benefits or whether the opportunities there in terms of leadership that leads to mental, educational, social and career benefits that come from girls playing in sport, as well as obviously the involvement of girls and women in sport contributes so many benefits to sport and community as a whole. If you want to just go to the next slide. Um, so some of these barriers I won't talk about because um, Chris touched on those, but um, similar there is, is unfortunately we do have those barriers um, for girls that we need to address. So if we want to go to the next slide, I wanted to talk about a couple of them in a little bit more detail. And that word fun is something that comes up over and over and over again with girls. And so can we find practical solutions to make the sport more enjoyable? And the way we go about sport for girls, as you'll see over the presentation, does need to be a little bit different because their needs for sport is different. Um, and that, that theme, that social aspect, Chris talked about boyfriends. No, it's not really. It comes under, she was right, it comes under a much broader area of more opportunities for girls when they become teenagers outside of sport, whether it's social, whether it's a job, whether it's school. Um, and girls do tend to be a lot more social. You'll see that third point there. Then um, boys, so they really do need that support in order for them to be able to continue with the sport. Also, we find that the competition and the structure of the programs can sometimes be too competitive for what girls might want. I know um, a lot of the coaches here are high level rep coaches, but maybe there's an opportunity to offer less competitive options for girls that then leads them into the representative sport. Um, 
I, I've watched over time the number of girls, if I give a specific basketball example, that decrease as trials come up, as girls get older. There's still so many boys that turn up for those trials in the older age groups. And the girls that turn up just get less and less and less. So how can we create a bigger pool to begin with so that we've got more girls to pull on um, when we get into the high level sport? And maybe that is by creating more opportunities for fun, less high level sport for them to get involved with, meet friends and have a really welcoming and inclusive environment for those girls to come into so that we're capturing girls that maybe have thought, oh, well, I can't do reps, so I can't do basketball. How can we get those girls that may actually end up with a lifelong love of the sport? You just want to turn to the next slide, please, Jared. So some of these um, things to maybe think about are there are there ways to overcome the fact that you know it needs to be enjoyable? Where's the social aspect of it versus or is it always competitive? Um, have we got the coach match appropriate to the girls? The girls tend to be more perfectionistic. They tend to be harder on themselves and their skill level. Are we matching that coach up? And I do talk about some specific personality traits that you can pull on when you're coaching girls. Um, is that club welcoming the girls and their parents? Are the facilities in the change rooms appropriate to girls or are they sharing change rooms? Do teenage girls have the specific facilities they need to feel comfortable when they're getting changed? Um, or does the change room door open on, on the, the way in and the girls can be seen when they're getting changed? These are, these are uh, real stories that I hear from girls as to why they're not doing sport and there's not an area for them to, to, um, to get changed in that's appropriate. The lack of time, um, Chris spoke to the role models. I can't support that enough, Chris. We need to get more female role models for them to look up to. The research supports this over and over again, um, as does the body image issues. And I talk ways around that when I address uh, one of my later questions. Um, and yes, there's the cost, there's the risk of injury, but then there's the friendship aspect. And we as coaches need to find ways to facilitate that social and friendship aspect, which I also talk to. Um, and just, I guess, society pressure, you know, about we've got on them every day from social media about what really is a girl supposed to look like and what really is a girl supposed to be doing. Um, fortunately, there has been huge improvements in, those, in that and we're really hoping that COVID hasn't kind of derailed our progress with girls' sport. Um, but, you know, that is another possible reason as well. Um, and then there's a big jump as well with girls that go from primary school up in terms of the skill level that's required in sports and the lack of support for that jumping skill level. Is there some way we can fill that gap so girls don't, once they get to year seven, go, oh, look, it's all too hard for me now. I just haven't got the skills to keep going. Because something we are facing now is that, on that last point, is that girls now have a plethora of options when it comes to sport. And if their expectations are not being met in that sport, with that coach, with that environment, then yeah, sure, they can drop out, but they can also change sport completely. Um, and so we need to, to keep that in mind also. I just feel it would be remiss of me in my sport scientist role just to not highlight a couple of little slides here. I won't go into detail, but I really want you to be aware that there is just a dramatic underrepresentation of females in all areas of sport. And that is even down to sports science, the lack of research done on female athletes. It, 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 it is um, relevant also, um, sorry, Jared, I'm going ahead with the slides, I'm not telling you to. I'm getting <laughs> carried away here. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm going to talk to some of the underrepresentation. There was the sports science underrepresentation, but also on slide eight, 
there's the underrepresentation of players um, that you will see there uh, when compared to um, boys and men in all age groups across sport. Then um, slide nine, and also the leaders in sport. Yes, basketball, as Chris mentioned, is doing particularly well, um, and it is improving. But if we look at sports across the board, there is still a lot of improvement there in terms of um, equality there. And um, slide 10, I guess what the girls are looking for, coming back to your question, is support in sport across different areas there. And if you want to go to slide 11, I've shown that in terms of, it is, a, it, is it could be a complex issue, if you just press again there, Jared. Um, <laughs> with many factors influencing it, but there are solutions. And so I will get to that on my, when I address my next question. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Martha. I'll promise to stay on my toes for the rest of the presentation. Me too. Sorry. <laughs> um, we, have, we actually had a couple questions. Yeah. Uh, one from Georgie uh, about what suggestions do you have to maintain a competitive structure but less stressful and more fun? And is it just about changing the win-loss point system? Um, it's not just about changing the win-loss. It's about being creative in what your competition looks like. You know, why do you just have to have a five-on-five -five, um, comp where you have four 10-minute quarters? You know, what's wrong with running um, uh, two 10-minute halves? Um, what's wrong with having, um, uh, I guess, 40 girls just rock up and you put them into different teams and you play games for, for five minutes? Um, before they actually go into their normal teams. Um, you know, I think the, the more times at training that you have small-sided games uh, where you mix the, the group members up, um, that can actually help facilitate to reduce anxiety during um, your traditional five-on-five -five basketball comp. So don't just look at it, Georgie, in terms of what the structure of a competition could look like because there's there's so many different ways you could slice and dice that. You know, it's just really about not just your imagination but what your capacity of your facilities are and, you know, the, the referees and, and those sorts of things. But if you rewind that back and say, what are you doing at training to actually facilitate that so a, a, a female player feels like they are able to... Um, contribute in a competitive environment, even though they might not be the best shooter or the best passer. Um, I think um, one of the other questions Marinette had was around, or maybe it was an observation around cultural influence and, and its impact on um, females participating. And, and uh, that actually really resonates with me because I, I come from a Croatian background um, to can actually convince my parents to play sport what was difficult. Um, I was very fortunate that I didn't have a little brother. Um, so I was able to do things that traditional females in a Croatian environment weren't permitted to do. Um, so I 100% agree with your observation, um, uh, Marinette, about that. Um, and also when Martha sort of drew into that, um, in, into, into her presentation around that welcoming environment. Georgie, if you think about um, the competitive environment, how welcoming is it when um, teams enter your facility? Uh, how welcoming do they feel when they're sitting down on benches? What do they see? You know, what do they hear as well? All these things, um, I guess, contribute to, uh, I guess, women and girls feeling like they can contribute in a competitive environment. Sorry, Jared, I, I hope I didn't um, jump in inappropriately. No, not at all. That's the whole point of this, Chris. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. Martha, did you have uh, any points to add regarding competition structure and making it less stressful and more fun? Um, I, I will. I'm, I'm, I, I agree with what Chris said, but I also think there's little things like, um, you know, playing music, um, you know, before games and in between games. It's, girls love music and just making it a bit more fun. 
and ensuring that everyone has the same purpose. So the reps as well, that this is about giving the girls a go and having fun. And this can be done also in training as well, just giving them time to have a chat, giving them time to be social, giving them playing music every warm up and cool down, picking a different girl to choose that, having that unstructured play, having those small games where they're not completely dictated to um, and they can make those decisions themselves and learn about decision making in a really friendly, positive way rather than always be very, very structured. Yep. And I love the idea of having a competition around the playlist. I mean, that could get really intense as well. 